three, four. Come on and worship with us this morning. Rise to your feet if you would. What does it mean? What does it mean to be saved? Is it more than just a prayer to pray? More than just a way to heaven? What does it mean to be His? To be born in His likeness? Know that we have a purpose to be salt, to be salt and light in the world, in the world, to be salt and light. Good day to worship God, amen. Welcome to Light of Christ Church. As many of you know, my name is Rich Ginto. I'm the worship pastor here. So glad to be here. So glad to be worshiping with you guys. If you will, I want to give you just a few moments to turn around and say hi to some friends there and welcome them to Light of Christ as well.
Feel free to take your seat for just one moment. Well, good morning and welcome to Light of Christ United Methodist Church. I'm Marianne Romanat and I'm the lead pastor here. You can be seated just for a moment. And if you would uh, open your bulletin, this is a wonderful resource for all of us to know what is happening in ministry together. So be sure you check this out. And if you would right now, just tear off the tear off portion with me. If you're new to us, if this is your first or second visit, we especially ask that you fill out the information on this tear-off card. Uh, if you're a regular attender or member, you can just write your name, the names of people who are here today. And on the back side, there's a place for prayer requests. Uh, we encourage you to share your prayer requests with our prayer team so that we can pray for you. And we're just so glad you're here. We welcome you warmly. And we're here to come, grow, go. Uh, we come together uh, to grow uh, together and go deeper. And then we go out to serve. And that's our mission statement here. Um, if you would, if, you're, if this is your first time with us, if you'll hold on to this and at the end of the service, just take it out to the Welcome Center and you can trade it in for a gift that we have for you. So we hope that you'll do that after the service. Now let's stand together and continue to worship. Oh, my God. 
no other name in heaven and around earth by which men can be saved. Oh, Jesus, the God of our salvation, call on your name we pray this morning God that you would visit us in this place not just inhabit this building but inhabit this temple which is our bodies our minds and our hearts it's an acceptable vessel. Just be with us this morning, God. It's in your name we pray. Hallelujah. Praise God. You may be seated. Amen. It's good to be with you this morning. I almost pulled the keyboard down. That would have been interesting, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, today is the last Sunday in January. How did that happen? And we are concluding today our series about some of the most difficult and challenging teachings of Jesus. And uh, by doing so, by digging deeper, we have found treasure uh, in some of the most difficult passages we can find in the Gospels. And that's what happens when we go deeper with God. We find treasure underneath. Um, so we have been in a series called Jesus Said That, and we've looked at some of these passages. Of uh, The first Sunday, we talked about the bread of life, that Jesus said his, his flesh was true uh, bread, to, true food, and his blood was true drink. And we talked about how what he was referring to was entering into his death, uh, taking on his death, taking up our cross. The second week, we talked about the parable of the dishonest manager and how God longs for us to be shrewd for the purposes of the kingdom of heaven, uh, not to feather our own nests, but to reach out and share the gospel with others. And then last week, we talked about the passage where Jesus says that we must hate our brother and sister, uh, mother and father, and it, if we are going to be his disciples. And we learned that what he's saying there is there are times when we need to detach and turn away from our family when there's a conflict between what they hope for us and what God's calling is in our lives. Today, we'll hear from Jesus about the hiddenness of God at times, and we struggle with that. And so did the disciples, we'll find out. And they asked Jesus about that in our passage this morning. Before we dive into that, though, I want to tell you about a movie that's about to come out a month from now. It's called The Son of God. And this movie was created by the same people who created the Bible miniseries on the History Channel a few months ago. What happened was Roma Downey and her husband and some other folks involved with that project decided that they needed to expand upon the scenes about Jesus' ministry and life. And so they decided to actually create a movie for the big screen. I did not realize until Jan Pugh and I went to the a preview of the movie the other night. Uh, and actually, Roma Downey was there. It was really cool. And we got to meet her uh, here in Charlotte. But they shared with us that the last movie about Jesus on the big screen was The Passion of the Christ, and that was 10 years ago. Before that, the last time that a movie was made about Jesus' entire life and ministry and death and resurrection was The Greatest Story Ever Told. And my friends, that was in 1965. So this is a really big deal. Um, this, this is something that we don't need to miss as God's people. And also it's an opportunity to start conversations about who Jesus is with people who struggle with that, you know, who wonder what is the big deal about Jesus um, and who wonder about church and, and these things, uh, who wonder about faith at all. So uh, we wanted to offer this as an opportunity, uh, our evangelism ministry. We, wanted to, to, we decided that what we would do is reserve a movie theater for uh, the Light of Christ family and our friends. And we just want to encourage you to save the date. We think the date is going to be Wednesday, February 26th, so exactly a month from today. It, that's actually two days before the movie opens, so it will be kind of a sneak peek uh, two days in advance. 
And we're hoping, we haven't gotten final confirmation, but I think we will tomorrow or the next day. Uh, we're thinking that it'll be Wednesday the 26th at 6.30 in the evening. So save the date if you can and start to pray about who you should invite uh, to come and be a part of that with you. And we'll start selling vouchers uh, to attend. They'll be, tw- they'll be $12 a piece, uh, hopefully next Sunday. So that's an exciting opportunity. We'll be able to speak briefly before the movie and briefly during the credits. And we'll be able then to set up the movie a little bit, help people to understand better what they're going to see. And then at the end, we'll be able to follow up and invite people to our Lenten sermon series, which will be called The Jesus Experiment. And it'll be going deeper into who is Jesus, why does he matter? So it'll start the conversation, and then hopefully we can encourage people to continue the conversation um, with us. So this morning, Rachel Johnson is coming to read our passage from Matthew chapter 13 for the sermon. In this, Jesus has told just told the parable of the sower. And what he's talked about is a man who is sowing seed, and there's four types of soil that the seed has fallen on. There's the path, uh, which the word gets stolen away immediately. Um, There's rocky ground that allows for some growth, but then when there's heat, the root is not deep, and so it withers away. Uh, There's thorny soil, which the the plants come up, but then they're choked uh, by by the thorns. And then finally, there's good soil that bears uh, fruit. And so Jesus has just told this story about this farmer and four types of soil, and he leaves it at that. He doesn't explain it uh, to the hearers. And that's when this, these words come, uh, this question comes from the disciples. And Rachel's going to read it for us. Good morning. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because of the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have, will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become colossed. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. Wow. Alien invasion. Okay. Thank you. All right, so these words from Jesus are perplexing. It, it seems to be that he's setting up this, this dualism between insiders and outsiders. That there are some of us who, who get it, who are given the gift of understanding uh, God's word, and there, were others, there are others who do not and never will. This is troubling to us, obviously, and that's why I'm including it in this series. And the disciples also want to know, you know, why is it, Jesus that you teach in parables? Why is, is it that you make God's word hidden to some degree? We struggle with the same. Why doesn't God speak up, <laughs> especially to those who are really longing to know that there is a God and who that God is? Why not present it in a clearer way? Why create any barriers for your listeners, Jesus? They're seeming to ask. And so Jesus answers them and talks about parables and tries to give them an understanding of why this is his approach. Jesus' response makes it worse, though, it seems to us. First of all, he says, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. So that sounds like insider's talk, but he's actually humbling those who see themselves as insiders. What Jesus is saying there is what you understand is a gift from God. The reason you have faith is a gift. It's very similar to what Jesus says to Peter when when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? In another part of Matthew, Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus' response there is to say, hey, that's a gift. 
You don't understand that because you're so wise and discerning, right? Because you're an insider. You understand that because that's a gift God has given you. He says, Simon, son of Jonah, this was revealed to you by, not by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Blessed are you. So this is similar to that. Jesus is saying, those of you who get it, who can hear me, who have eyes to see, ears to hear, you're blessed. It's a gift from God. Then Jesus goes on to talk about this, these supposed insiders and outsiders. He says, whoever, whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance Meaning, those who have understanding and faith, even a small amount, will continue to increase. More and more we will understand the things of God because, again, it will be a gift in our lives. Well, that's all fine and dandy. We like that. But what about the flip side? And Jesus talks about that too. He says, whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. So Jesus is saying here, those who struggle faith will continue, struggle with faith, will continue on that trajectory. They will continue to struggle, Jesus says. And, and he says they're fulfilling a prophecy that the Old Testament prophet Isaiah talked about, saying that they see, but they don't see. They hear, but they don't hear. It says, that the prophecy says that they have calloused hearts, they close their ears and their eyes, and they don't turn to God. And here's where Jesus' tone lets us know about the longing of God for these folks, folks who can't hear and can't see. There's a key turning point. He says, otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. You can hear the desire of God there. God is not describing a reality that God likes. You know, God doesn't enjoy that some people can't seem to find him. God grieves over that. God says, if only they would soften their hearts and turn to me, and I would heal them. Well, some of us find ourselves frustrated by these words, and I must tell you, this is my main frustration with God, and I pray in bold ways with God about this. I say, God, you need to speak up. <laughs> I, I tell God what he should be doing as God, and I know he appreciates that a lot. <laughs> but I do. I get frustrated with God about this, and I think that's not only okay. I think that's part of what it means to belong to God. I say, you know you got to rethink this thing. This whole parable thing, this whole hidden thing, what's up with that? I mean, really. Speak up, God. Because there are people out there who not only don't know you, they don't know they're supposed to know you. So where are you, God? Speak up. I get bold with them. You may not like that. They may make, they may make you uncomfortable. But I think it's biblical. Where are you, God? The psalmist cries out. Why are you so far from me? Show up. Come down, speak your word. And so some of us are frustrated with that. Why is God so hidden? If, if people have hardened their hearts and closed their ears and their eyes, then why doesn't God soften their hearts? Why doesn't God open their eyes? Why doesn't God reveal himself to that person in the way they can understand? And maybe God does. And I have no doubt that God is trying in all of our lives to help us see him. But sometimes I want to say, let's try a new way, <laughs> just to be honest. So, but Jesus continues and perseveres in teaching in parables, not only in his ministry, but today. His meaning is not blared from the loudspeaker. It's not written across the skies. There's no thunder and lightning show for most of us. Some of us there is. Some of us have experienced that. But Jesus' teaching about the kingdom of God is hidden, subtle, teasing, waiting for us to discover it, for the treasure that it is. The, the disciples struggle with this, and so it's okay for us to struggle with this too. Jesus seems to be saying the kingdom of God is hidden, yes, it can be subtle, but it's there. And it's available as a gift, just like it's a gift to you, Jesus says. Don't, don't be arrogant about it. It's a gift to you, and it's a gift available to all. 
for those who are willing to seek it, for those who have hardened hearts, distracted lives, stubborn and closed ears, it will not be revealed, Jesus says. It won't be forced on anyone. I won't force my grace on anyone. But God longs to give the gift. Like a wise and experienced teacher, Jesus knows that giving five points and principles and then giving a pop quiz, expecting his followers to give him back exactly what he's just told them as information won't change their lives. It won't touch their hearts. Spoon-feeding his hearers God's word will only backfire because there'll be no change, no new creatures in Christ if we're given his word that way. But teaching in parables, enticing us to go further, to find more, to ask big questions, to dig deeper, just like we're doing in this sermon series, That's what will lead us into a relationship with God that will carry us through our lives. Jesus knows how to teach. He entices us to go further, to go deeper. This week, I watched a three-hour documentary called The Big Silence. It was released by the BBC in 2010, and it was fascinating. Um, It's about a Roman Catholic Benedictine monk at Worth Abbey in England, And, of course, he's in the middle there. He recruited people who would be willing to come to the abbey and discover what silence could do in their lives. And so these five people came to practice silence and solitude, which the Benedictine monks do every day, several times a day. So these folks, five of them, responded to the ad, however he put the ad out there. Interestingly, only one of the five was a professing Christian. The other four, uh, one of them had rejected faith, had been a Christian at one time, but because of uh, losing her father, she had questioned the whole thing. The other three are fairly secular folks. There was one in particular who really struck me. It's the man at the top on the left. His name is John. And he was a person who, when he first started um, the retreat, he told uh, Father Jamison, he said, I am not religious. In fact, I'm anti-religion because religion has done more uh, ill in the world than it has done good. And so he was very honest and upfront about that. He said, I'm interested in why people like you, talking to Father Jamison, have seen something I can't get in touch with. So he really struggled with with anything having to do with God, yet he was interested to see what silence could do for him. And so these folks did a three-day trial run, three days of silence, and of course that was you know, really new to them, very different. They had to unplug from everything in life and just be, be there and be still. That was hard for them. They went back to their lives for a few days, and then they came back for what they called the big silence, and that was an eight-day retreat at a Jesuit retreat center. For eight days, the only conversation they could have was for uh, 30 minutes to an hour with their spiritual director each day. Well, you should see what you should have seen what happened, and you can watch it, by the way, on YouTube. It's a fascinating documentary. All five of these folks resisted it at first. They were angry, they were grumpy, some of them rebelled, went off to the side and talked. (laughs) Um, They were really not doing well with this for the first few days. But by day five, they all finally got to where they agreed to be silent and to just see what that experience would do for them. And what is so fascinating is, with all the different degrees of where they were with God, all five of them found God in their own way. And God spoke to them in powerful ways in this retreat where they had no distractions except just being with themselves and being with God. They were changed by the experience, every single one of them. Um, And some of them found faith for the first time. John was completely transformed um, by it. One of the last days of the retreat, he was walking along, and he, he started to have this supernatural experience. He was walking along, and suddenly he knew that Jesus was beside him, and he started having a conversation back and forth with Jesus. And then, uh, two days later... He, he heard a voice. He was in a chapel, and he was silently praying, 
and he heard a voice say, you've been looking, and I have always been here. You just weren't listening. John said that that changed his life forever. He said, the voice was inside me, but it was not me. He said, it was remarkable. I just have to trust it. The documentary is a real testimony, I think, to the ability of all people to know God if they will set aside all distractions and focus on listening and on meeting with God. Maybe this is like Jesus describing in these difficult words from Matthew today, people who will soften their hearts, open their eyes, open their ears, and turn to God will find that God will heal them. And the healing that took place in the lives of these five people was remarkable, and it was unique for each one of the five, the healing that God did in their lives. Well, faith in God is truly a gift, and there are plenty of ways we can miss out on that. Um, Just like Jesus, whose listeners found him intriguing and thought he told interesting parables but never really delved beneath the surface, Um, Today, we also can hear and see God, but miss that. And so we want to be able to recognize him. Um, I've asked Justin Lober to come and uh, share with us today a little of his story. He shared with me recently his testimony, and it was so powerful that I wanted him to have the opportunity to share that with you too. So thank you, Justin. Thank you. So my name is Justin. I live here in Valentine with my wife, uh, Denise, and my son, Charlie. We moved here a year and a half ago, and probably the number one reason why I moved was for the warm climate, and uh, (laughs) obviously uh, we didn't make the right choice, so we had the computer out yesterday Googling uh, cities on the equator and to see where we might move next, but uh, so when we first moved here, we spent like a month or two trying to find a church, and then we came here for a while, and then my son started going to school at Charlotte Christian, no? Carmel Baptist. <laughs> so we thought it would just be convenient to go to church where he attends school, so we tried that, but we liked it here, so we came back, and we've been coming here for like, I don't know, six, eight months or something like that. And the point I'm trying to make is I would have expected to be coming here like maybe three years before being up on stage giving my testimony, but, <laughs> you know, eight months is cool, so. Um, <laughs> if you want to know when I actually said the prayer, it was at a very young age, you know, second or third grade at VBS. And my teacher at VBS painted such a vivid, frightening picture of hell that I just didn't want to go there. And I would do anything <laughs> to not go there. It was like, <laughs> so I said the prayer just so I wouldn't have to go to hell. So I'm just curious, has anyone else accepted the Lord out of fear of hell? No? All right. Okay, a couple. That's good. So, um, but, you know, one thing that's like a truth in life and it's really relevant now as a parent is that Like, never to assume that kids don't know anything or that they're dumb because kids actually know a lot more than we give them credit for. So what happened to me is that at a very young age, my parents got divorced. And uh, my dad got custody of my sister and I. And this was when I was, like, two years old. So as far as I know, I've always just had two sets of parents. But um, my dad married a very conservative Christian woman from Texas. And, you know, he went to work on her and... He converted soon after they got married. An interesting aside, uh, we were attending Church of Christ at that time, and they believed that you're not saved unless you get baptized. So my dad accepted the Lord at like 1 in the morning, and they dragged us out of bed and took us down to the church and <laughs> baptized them like, in the middle of the night just to make sure it was official. But uh, <laughs> So anyway, um, so from that point on, I was being raised in a Christian house. But there was all this tension because... My mother, who I would see every other weekend, she's a pagan, a committed pagan. And so as soon as she found out that I was being raised Christian, it was her job and her limited time with us to make sure that she undid everything that my parents did. So she was very actively teaching us the opposite of what my parents taught us. But meanwhile, also, from my parents towards her, there was a lot of um, strife and hatred and meanness and everything. And so for all the time of going to church and like sitting there, as a young kid, they don't look like they're paying attention, and they're not, but if they hear the same thing over and over again, eventually a kid will, will learn it, right? So I'd sit there like this, <laughs> and there were, the ceiling was planks, and you just like count the planks. <laughs> you know, every Sunday for like three years, you could do it here with these, with these little cubes. Don't encourage that, please. <laughs> Turn the iPhones off, everybody. So, 
but eventually <laughs> I came to realize, even at a young age, that the situation in my house with the way that people treated each other, especially with the divorce, was not what I was hearing the preacher preach on Sunday. And I started to have a lot of confusion about that, never mind that my mom was trying to raise me pagan, my parents trying to raise me Christian. I was just confused about the whole thing. And as I got older, that confusion turned to anger directed at the church. And really, by the time I was in high school, I didn't want anything to do with the church. I thought everyone in church, the whole thing was a fraud. And I hated it, I hated God, and you know that was it. And I carried this all the way through into college in my junior year I transferred out to Eastern Long Island uh, to like a beach town. There's a college out there. And in the wintertime there, it's very desolate. And I lived alone in a cottage by the sea. You know, It's not sad and depressing at all. It was actually really cool. But um, I would just literally, because I didn't know anyone, I would spend all this time you know, away from my family and influences back home. I would just like wander around doing nothing. And uh, that's actually still one of my favorite pastimes. I love to just wander around and do nothing. So, but... You know, it was just interesting that they were all absent now, and it was just me by myself. And one night, I was just driving along the dune road in my truck and doing nothing, and I wasn't seeking God, I wasn't praying, I wasn't asking the big questions, but out of nowhere, I just had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, and it was weird. But I kind of, here's what happened. I was just driving along, and all of a sudden, I just felt like a warmth flow over my body and like a total like euphoria and an actual sensation of like lightness to where like the, this weight was taken off my shoulders. And uh, it felt so good, I just started laughing. And I was driving down the road laughing, and I just said, thank you, Jesus, you're good. And, uh, whew. <laughs> that, you know, that changed my life. I'm not gonna say that, you know, I've been like awesome since then. I mean, obviously it's, <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a process, but uh, I wanted to read you, I wanted to read you Matthew 18, Matthew 18, 12. It says, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 in the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. So I feel like I was that one sheep, and for whatever reason, you know, God sought me out. I wasn't even looking for him. And to this day, I'm still trying to figure out why I did that because he must have had a reason for that. And so, you know, no matter what happens, the ups and downs of your Christian walk, I always can go back to that moment and be like, wow, God did that for me at that time for a reason. And, you know, I'm really excited to find out still, you know, 20 years later what that is. And But praise God they did. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. The faith is a gift. Uh, it looks different for each one of us, right? Not everybody has an experience, a supernatural experience of God, and that's okay. For each one of us, God knows what we need, and God knew what Justin needed uh, to reach him and to transform him and begin him on the process, like he said, to awesomeness, right? Uh, but, uh, but that each one of us will, ha will have a different way that God reaches us. And it's personal and it's real for each one of us. For some of us, we're struggling with that today. Um, we, we need God to reach out. We need God to speak up, as I was saying earlier. And so I want us to, to have a time to pray about that. For some of us, this is about you, that you need to ask God to speak to you in a way that you understand, to open your eyes, to soften your heart, uh, and, and be open to him. So... During the next song, uh, the praise team is going to come up now. Um, we want to invite you to come and pray, uh, to kneel if you'd like, and have time of prayer with God. Our prayer team uh, will be here, and we'll uh, come and, and lay a hand on you and pray silently in agreement with you. Uh, for some of you, your prayer might not be about yourself so much as it is about someone else, that perhaps there's a person or more than one person in your life who needs to hear from God in a way they can understand. And so you're coming and, and calling on God to do that, um, to reach out, and to use you also as part of that reaching out to them. So let's join in prayer uh, during this next song. Ask God to soften hearts and touch lives, and we're just going to agree together asking God to do that. For the sake of Jesus who came to make him known, amen.
please feel free to come up to the front like Pastor mentioned. If you want to pray or if you want to kneel at your seat. The song we're about to sing, maybe you haven't heard it before, but you'll feel like you have because it's inspired by an older hymn that talks about totally needing God. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you. Thomas, and I'm the youth pastor here. Um, I just want to share with you some exciting things that are coming up in the life of our church. 
The first thing is today um, at 12.30, we begin a new Um, and it'll meet for four weeks, and this is a great class to come to right after church. If you are new and want to learn more about this church and how you can be involved and just more about your walk in faith. And so we'll meet in 104 for that. We also have a welcome team, guest services training right after church in this room in the sanctuary. And so if you are a part of the welcome team, please stay for that. We are developing a men's softball team that will begin soon. And I want to invite Todd Strader to come up and share about that. Good morning. Um, I want to thank Mary Ann for contacting me about a month or so ago to talk about playing softball again. Um, it's great fellowship. And first, I want to, again, we are so blessed to have Mary Ann, Abby, and our praise team. Please, please give it up for them. I want to tell you a little history. Uh, it's probably been 14 years ago we fielded our first softball team at Light of Christ. And at that time, we were all younger then. Um, but um, we, uh, we had three teams. So we had over 40 people that were playing softball in fellowship, and some of it was passionate, I'll use that word, but uh, maybe something else. But, um, and I was gonna wear my softball outfit today, my Light of Christ vest, my Speedo, I mean my uh, uh, softball shorts, but um, I didn't. But, you know, moving forward, our, our, last, our last team was uh, 2009. We were 18 and one, had a great team, and it kind of fizzled after that and just didn't put it together. But um, I'm glad we're starting. You know, there's signups are out there. We've got six people out there signed up already. Please, old, young, you know, we, you've got to be 18 to play, but if we don't have enough, they'll let you play younger than that. We've got our cleanup hitter. Rich Gento's already signed up. We saw that. So <laughs> um, we're excited. Um, and uh, so please sign up. If you have questions, call me, email me, and I'll be happy to help you. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. For the women, we invite you on a women's spiritual retreat that is on March 21st to the 22nd um, at Canuga Conference Center in Hendersonville, North Carolina. And we invite you to check that out and sign up, um, be a part of that women's retreat. We also have this Wednesday a healing service at 7 p.m. And we invite you all to come to this special service of, of healing, both spiritual and I mean internal and um, physical and just all kinds of healing and it will be a time of prayer and our youth are beginning to raise funds for our summer mission trip and so on February 15th we will have a Valentine's dinner um, which will be raising funds for that the youth will be showing their talents and also a serving dinner that night so mark that on your calendars and I want to invite uh, Taylor and Brooke, Tyler and Brooke Miller, uh, I'm sorry, um, they are missionaries for Campus Crusade for Christ on college campus and to share about their ministry. Um, our church supports them monthly in their ministry and we want you to learn more about what we're supporting. Thank you so much. We're excited to be here and worship with you guys this morning. Um, like she said, we're Tyler and Brooke Miller, and our little boy Garrett, you can see him in the picture there. He's a little bit bigger than that now. He's still a little guy. Um, he is about almost four months old, and we were actually supposed to come and speak to you guys about four months ago. Well, he was born two and a half weeks early, so that put a damper on things. But we're here now. We're excited to be here. Um, we are missionaries with Crew. It's the College Ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ International. And we predominantly work at UNC Charlotte right now, but we've also worked on other campuses in the Charlotte area. And our team of staff in the city work across the city, so we've got a large scope. Um, both Brooke and I were involved with Campus Crusade. I was involved at NC, NC State, and uh, Brooke went to Clemson. And so um, we get along real well during football season. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was great. Our involvement as students led, led us to come on staff uh, before we met each other. And long story short, we ended up meeting when we were working at UNC Wilmington, our first assignment together. And we fell in love, got married, and moved here in 2010. And um, so we've been working here since then, and it's been a joy. 
I wanted to briefly share with you the mission and the vision of Crew, if you've never heard it before. Our vision is that everyone would know someone who truly follows Christ. And our mission is threefold, to win students to Christ by sharing the gospel and living life with them, to build them in their faith. We have a large group meeting on campus. We've got men's and women's Bible studies, retreats, conferences throughout the year, summer missions opportunities stateside and around the world. Um, and then just send them to the world as Christ-centered laborers. And we have different things going on with that. And a lot of it is involved with giving seniors the mindset that when they graduate, they're going into a mission field wherever they end up. You don't have to be a full-time minister to be a missionary wherever you go. We also have, uh, like I mentioned, some summer missions projects and things like that that students can get involved in. There's also long-term overseas internships and full-time, intern, um, full-time jobs even with us as well. So a lot of different opportunities for students to get involved um, I wanted to share one quick story with you, though, about a guy named Tim, and I feel like this encapsulates our mission and our vision really well. It's something that God did. And uh, when Tim was a freshman, his sweet mate's girlfriend invited, um, she invited her boyfriend and all of his sweet mates to come to a weekly meeting. Tim was in that group. So Tim showed up, just kind of somewhat reluctantly, just thought he had nothing else to do. Come check it out. So at that meeting, Tim heard the gospel. And he'd also checked on a card. He wanted to hear more information about what it means to know God personally. And so I got lunch with him the next day. We sat down, and I got to just chat, catch up, talk about life. He's a Carolina fan. I'm a state fan. So, you know, we kind of talked about that, and uh, it was a good time. But then I got to ask him, hey, Tim, have you ever heard what it means to know God personally? And he said, no, I'd be really interested to hear. I wanted to know what it means. And so I got to walk through the gospel with him. It was really exciting. He finished, I got asked him questions, seeing where he was with his faith, and he wasn't sure where he was. Well, we continued to meet, and over the next few weeks, we continued to walk through faith and what it meant to, to walk with Jesus. Well, a few weeks after that, he gives me a phone call around 10, 10.30 at night, and he's like, hey, um, I, I, uh, I don't know how to say this, I, I want Christ in my life. What do I do? And I got to just talk with him about, well, what, what is faith? What does the gospel say about faith and how you can start that relationship with him? And so it's been a joy to walk with him since his freshman year. He's now a junior. He's an engineering student. And he's thinking about, hey, I want to get an internship this summer in engineering, and I want to use it for the glory of God. And he knows that when he graduates, he wants to be involved in missions, even though he doesn't think he will be a missionary full time. So it's really exciting for us to see God do things like that. And we'd have, both of us have stories upon stories that we could share with you. But for the sake of time, I thought I'd share that one with you. We're here today to thank you as a church body for supporting us financially and through prayer. We are incredibly grateful for each one of you. Thank you, Pastor Romanat, for just having us come and and meet everyone. And we have a table in the back, and we'd love to come talk to you more afterwards as well. Um, Just to let you know, our ministry is fully funded by individuals and churches who are concerned about the mission and the vision of reaching the college generation with the gospel. And so we depend upon that. And currently, Brooke and I are taking a season off campus to work full-time on raising some monthly support that we need to continue our work. And once we have our goal met, we'll be able to return to campus full-time. And so um, this is something we are trusting the Lord for. And so we wanted to invite each of you individually to come and be part of our team, if that would be how the Lord led you. And even if you can't give financially, we wanted to let you know we want to come meet with each of you individually. We actually have the time to do that right now. And so we'd love to come tell you about how you can partner with us through prayer and finances. And there's a few other ways, too. And so we have a sign-up sheet in the back. We'd love for you guys to put down your information. We'd love to get up with you. And like I said, there's no obligation to give towards our ministry financially. We do need that, but we want to let you guys know. We want to get community involvement and people knowing what's going on. And a big thing, too, is networking. And in fact, Gene and Nancy Morris, we got connected with them pretty early on when we got to Charlotte, which is how we got connected to you guys. And so networking would be another way you guys could help us too. So thank you. Those are our needs. We would ask you to pray for us in this time as we raise support. um, And pray for the students on the campus uh, that they would continue to know Jesus and walk with him. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you. I just want want us to pray for their important work. So let's take a moment to pray for Tyler and Brooke. Uh, God, we just thank you for uh, these two who are willing to go in your name on the college campus. And Lord, we know that you've made such an impact through them. We pray that that will continue, God, uh, and that you'll provide for every need so that they can do that. We're grateful that we are part of their ministry, and we just pray your Holy Spirit 
would work in and through them, uh, just as we were talking about today, just so that hearts would be softened, eyes and ears opened uh, to your word and, and to your love for, for young people um, in this area. And we also pray for their family, God, their growing family, and we thank you for the gift of Garrett, and we just pray he'll continue to grow and thrive and uh, that your plan for him will unfold. God, we also lift up needs in our congregation today. We lift up Stan Lynch to you and his family at the death of his mother this week. We pray your comfort would surround Stan and his whole family. And God, we also uh, want to pray for Estelle Brindle's sister, Betty, who's had two surgeries this week. And we pray for her recovery, God, uh, that you would give her your healing touch. Thank you, Lord, for our church and for the ways you're, you're moving Now we offer to you our financial gifts so that your ministry uh, can happen in this place and beyond. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing. One, two, three, four. All of your promises won't let go of me. All of your promises won't let go of me.
How about that bass player? That was rocking. All right. <laughs> may, your, may your heart be soft. May your eyes be open, your ears be open for God this week. Pay attention. He's going with you, and if we remain awake, we will see him. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.